Thank you all so much for uh, hosting us and hosting me again. Um, I really look forward to getting back to Istanbul and to Aura, so I really appreciate the opportunity to join you again. Um, and also wanted to thank Echeche Lambaba and Yaratepe University, and um, also collaborators, um, Bahar Aktuna and Bernard Gold. And um, uh, Yaratepe faculty, um, Birchin, uh, Ezra, um, uh, Nilai uh, Pinar is there, um, uh, Junate Aras and uh, Aaron. Um, really appreciate, really enjoyed working with you all. And of course, I want to thank the students um, who we worked with. Um, it was uh, really uh, wonderful to uh, get back and see some familiar faces and also meet uh, new uh, students as well. And um, I have to say I learned a lot from you, um, and I appreciate that. So I'm going to um, introduce design build kind of in a bigger picture, um, but through a specific project. And, and then uh, Bahar uh, Hoje is going to talk about um, uh, a little bit more focused area. And then uh, Bernard Hoje is going to finish um, with a, with a uh, third part. And our, our goal is to hopefully inspire a conversation and um, kind of get some feedback from you and certainly from students who are here today as well. Um, so we're, we're hoping it's formal, but also informal in that, in that way. Um, so design build as both a pedagogy and a practice really um, coordinates two main areas. One is experiential learning, and the second is what we sometimes refer to as public interest design. And that second part, I'll talk a little bit um, later in the presentation, but that really is the connection with the community. Um, it might also be the connection to the context, um, but typically it's connecting university and community. The project that I'm uh, drawing from, just to kind of give a specific example, <laughs> to be able to talk maybe more generally about design build, is a project from a few years ago in North Florida, uh, in a place, uh, a town called White Springs. And it was a project for a pavilion um, for a, a community park that was also meant to commemorate uh, an African-American community's um, uh, teachers. Um, this was a, uh, a segregation era school um, that uh, had been closed and it was right adjacent to the site. So we were interested in finding ways to both serve the community but then also commemorate the teachers. And I'll show an image towards the end that was one of the ways that we tried to, uh, tried to do that. So one of the main ideas with experiential learning is, I mean, it, it sounds quite simple, but it's actually pretty complex, but it's an idea of learning by doing. Um, and backing up a little bit, Design Build is a form of experiential learning in which students, and, and many of you all are probably familiar with this, but it's where students actually um, build what they design. So that's one of the key ideas of Design Build. It's related to, um, it, or really has its pedagogical origins with philosopher John Dewey's idea, and one of his main ideas was learning by doing. Um, and an idea of reflection and action, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, in a minute. Uh, Dewey advocated education based on direct experience, and he placed uh, an emphasis on connecting uh, education with the immediacy of living. So there's a, there's a real immediate connection to the actions that we take and the reflection, the reflections that we make after um, conducting those actions. And there's many excerpts that you know, we could draw from, from Dewey's work, but this is one that um, uh, strikes me um, as uh, appropriate for today. It's cease conceiving of education as mere preparation for life and make it the full meaning of present life. And that idea of really bringing that immediate, uh, the immediacy of the learning process and the making process to bear. Um, zooming out just a little bit, 
Design build falls within the pragmatist tradition of collapsing distinctions of theory and practice. And we could probably have a long conversation about what or how we define praxis. That's P-R-A-X-I-S. And that, that relationship, that interchange between theory and practice. But it's certainly a part of design build, whether we're explicitly, we're always conscious of it, but whether we're explicitly talking about it, it's a part of the process of design build. One of the other things with design build, this is, and I chose this slide because it's like, at that kind of um, awkward moment of, are we gonna finish the project? Is it gonna, you know, where are we in, in kind of the middle of the construction? Um, and, you know, time is ticking and we're, um, you know, wondering where, where the next step is. And this is one of those moments where design folds back into build. So it's not so much design and then build as if it's kind of an easy kind of two-step process. It's much more like design, build, redesign, rebuild. So it's that really kind of uh, uh, recycled process of design and build. And it can sometimes be messy, but in a way, if you embrace that, that's part of the, uh, part of the process. Um, one other thing about, about Dewey it's, and that I think is probably relevant for this um, presentation is that Dewey makes, John Dewey makes the point that Experience embraces both stability and precariousness. So he's saying, yeah, there's stable foundations for the way that we work, but we're, we lack control in many of those situations. So that relationship of, of balancing uh, and, and being open to that precarity in the process, um, even if it's making mistakes or failing at a certain scheme that you propose that you will see mock-ups in a minute, that you mock it up and it just doesn't work, you have to be able to, to redirect and re remake um, to try to make it work. And that also relates to this um, operation in a context where there is known and unknown. There's a lot of unknowns when you start a project, when you start a design build project. I mean, you have a, you have a certain idea of an outcome, but it's often not as clear as in other forms of practice. So I'll just go a little bit step by step through this one project just to see how one project plays out um, and highlight a couple of key concepts along the way. One of the things with design build, and it's one of the things that I really love, is that it's a cons in, in my in um, sort of in the way that I like to work with design build, it's consensus driven. So it's not competitive in a way that I yeah, present my proposal. Baharaja presents her proposal and we sort of, you know, compete to see like what we're going to do. It's a discussion of all of the participants and everybody has to be uh, on the same page and also agree about the direction that we're going to take. So that's not always easy, but it's, I think, an important part when you're building something together. I think it's a really a key, key idea. So these are um, just pages. I hope the images are probably pretty small, but maybe just to get an idea of the early phases of a project and really using all of the tools in the design part that we like to use in you know, our own um, studio work, um, bringing that together and, and using those tools to move towards some kind of consensus. And then that second part that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the idea of connecting community and context is another one of the fundamental ideas of um, design build. And here's some, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, images showing us beginning preparing our presentation to the community and then our conversations with the community. This is about week three or four. So this was a semester long project, a little bit unlike what we were doing. And we'll talk about that kind of collapsing of time in a workshop. So this was a little bit more drawn out. So we worked on the schematic design for a couple of weeks. And then weeks three and four, we got ready and started to um, talk with the community to make sure that we're, that we're all on the same page. And you know, creating renderings, potential um, ideas of program and um, use on the site. And then 
about week five, we started um, what we call mocking things up, like the idea of a mock-up. And that's, in this, in this case, it was started with model making, three-dimensional model making to test ideas. We, we did some full-scale drawings. You can see on the middle left, um, these massive projected drawings where we were trying to understand details. Um, we built a couple of scale models. And then we moved into full scale to really mock up what this um, structure might begin to look like and, and how we were going to build it. And it was that moment of one to one that things things started really clicking for the students. And they really started, we really, and all of us really, not just the students, but everybody, we really started to see what this, I mean, even trying to tilt up one of the pieces and studio, you can see in the lower right, uh, you know, hitting the ceiling, we realized, okay, we, I guess we underestimated the, the height of the structure. Um, Luckily, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be an interior structure. Um, and then we, by week six, so seven or eight, we moved out to the site. And it was, in this case, it was a little distant from campus. It was about 45 minutes. So we um, ended up going there for a couple days at a time, which was a really good way for us to understand what the, what the site was about. Here we are um, looking at the, um, we didn't really have foundations for this project. It was, uh, um, had these little footings, kind of precast footings, and then we, we made the um, pavilion on skids, sort of like skis, so that the community, the community really wanted to be able to move this around, and they had a tractor that they could kind of position the pavilion depending on the site. So that was our um, uh, work um, with that. Here we are um, starting to raise some of the uh, pieces. Um, we, and as you all know, we're in the, in the workshop this, um, this time, we call these, on the upper right, we call them bents. So each, each structural piece we started to um, uh, put up. Um, one thing about um, design build that I also love is there's a playfulness to it. Um, and you know, I think that's something that we can really cultivate. I mean, what we're doing is very serious. We're building something at full scale. We're building something for other people. We're building stuff for situations, um, post potentially post-disaster situations. But at a certain moment, it's okay to remind ourselves that you know this is fun. Hopefully, it's fun. In the you know, in the ideal conditions, um, it's um, fun. That's me on the lower right getting. Uh, uh, a cooler full of water that, and I actually was never been so cold in my life it was like ice water um, there's also a process of refining and tuning to context um, and that's something that by working on site by building on site by redesigning on site you can really tune the project to the conditions and we worked a lot before we laid down those footings of the positioning and the angle of the uh, of the pavilion one of, the, one of the toughest ones was this back corner, and that in the upper left was trying to figure out how to make, we, we'd started to figure it out in the studio, but we never quite got it right, but we knew that once we got out to the site, things would change. So just trying to get the angles, a compound angle at the back corner, at each of the back corners, was one of those real challenges um, that uh, made, it, made it a real, a really kind of difficult, but also really rewarding once we, once we solved that. Um, and this, I just wanted to bring up another frame for this work, and it's Donald Schoen, um, who's a sociologist, but also a, a designer, and he coined the term um, reflective practitioner. And he wanted to convey how um, design practitioners undergo what he called reflective conversations. Um, and that's conversations with situations, but also with stakeholders or with clients. And that sort of reflection in action which he borrowed from John Dewey and kind of built upon that, um, influenced a lot of alternative practices. And I think it's, it's one really good one to look back on to understand where design build um, resides. And he talks about knowing uh, is inherent in intelligent action or the know-how is in the action. It's basically his, um, his idea. Here we are getting a little bit further along. I think this is week, week 16, I think this is right, like week 15, week 16, 
um, just at the moment where things are starting to uh, starting to come together. Um, and then um, this idea of reflective building, which I've kind of coined the term from Donald Schoen, trying to uh, connect it maybe a little more closely to design build, because he's Donald Schoen is talking about a broader activity of reflective practice. Um, and I think for us as designer builders, it's a, it's a process of reflective building. And I think we'll talk more about that um, as we go. The students called this the final push, week 16. <laughs> really um, working hard and uh, wrapping it up, which we had our own final push yesterday um, with the work. And this, I don't know if this is a great image, but on the right, the students came up with an idea of um, laser cutting the names of the teachers and then placing them sort of in the seams of the, you can kind of see it in the lower left, um, uh, in the seams of, the, of that lattice so that they were, um, their names were sort of cast. And that was the side of the pavilion that the, that the original school was located. And then that celebratory moment of ribbon cutting. Um, and this is funny, we were noticing like the ribbon, I didn't even realize this, but in the upper left, the ribbon like is across, like it's almost like we're, we're not, we're coming out of the structure, <laughs> we're like into the structure. I love that. It's like, it never dawned on me until you, were, you, know, you mentioned that. And I thought that was really, um, uh, yeah, it's really good. Oh, there's a better image of the, of the names. And then finally, the, um, these are the um, uh, Juneteenth celebrations. We were just in time for this to be used for that, um, for those events um, and uh, like quilt displays and. Um. So, um, and I'm gonna continue with the, with a project we did two summers ago. Um, and uh, most of you here are probably like you were in that project. Um, I'm gonna ask you raise your hands if you participated in ARCA project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So most I think most of us are here. So um, I I want to um, talk through this project and some of the uh, teachings we got from it. And um, it was the beginning of a long term research. And um, Berna is gonna add more to to the like uh, ongoing research, and um, maybe we can eventually like we are gonna like further iterate it with uh, other projects. But uh, so um, in summer 2022, we we worked on Arca, and uh, the background story to this is that um, I also come from. Um, the University of Florida, where as a, I was a student, uh, and Professor Haley was my um, supervisor. And um, I got exposed to design build process there, and um, and I studied in Cyprus originally, and I wasn't familiar with this uh, method at all. And uh, it was at the University of Florida, like when I attended there, um, I got exposed to this, and um, as someone who wasn't even aware of it, um, it, it made a lot of uh, changes to my way of thinking. Um, it is an interesting case in which um, in design bit pedagogy as an architecture student or, or, or as an architect, you move out of your representational realm and you get into touch with the reality of things. Um, it's, it's something that connects with the idea of uh, chaotic temporality. Um, so chaotic temporality is related to uh, being in touch with things, uh, being situated in a context in real time, and you like endure the context as in its like real cultural conditions, real social conditions, real physical conditions. And when we, when we work in, represent, in the representational realm, we step beyond that. This chaotic temporality got it gets destroyed, and you get a different experience of the design. And design build helps us to come back to reality with the things, uh, with the site, with the materials, so you come in close pro proximity to them. So um, when I moved from the University of Florida to Yeditepe University, um, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, introduce this uh, method to the department, I, and I had a very supportive environment, uh, very collaborative colleagues who also wanted to be part of that. 
So this project is, um, is the result of a very uh, collective, collaborative uh, process. Um, just to like give you like a bit idea about what is here, I'm sorry. So these are, uh, we have four structures here, which was the end product of the process. Um, these are three benches and uh, small mobile units, all designed and built by the students. And um, to start this project, it was like, it was an adventure, of course, like we didn't have design built before, uh, we didn't have it there before, and, and also like, although I worked with Professor Haley before, or, or I did like small uh, design build work, um, really like getting into design build method is very complex. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, and um, you need to establish a very good infrastructure for that. So. I can say that like most of the faculty and students were very alien to the idea, like, like I was uh, when I attended UF. Um, I was like or more on the familiar side, but still it was um, it's a very big undertaking uh, to jump into this. So uh, we had we thought about like how we can really like work through this, and um, we invited Professor Haley to sort of uh, lead us to help us to get into it uh, in a more smooth way. So um, it, the first event we, like, we did together uh, for design build was this workshop. Um, it took like months of preparation, a lot of correspondence on how we are gonna do this, uh, where it's gonna be the site, like what tools we are going to use. Uh, so it was very foreign in the beginning. And um, we started to establish the team together. Um, <coughs> Faculty, uh, most of the faculty was interested. Then we went on a call where the students also applied and they became part of the process. Um, so the eventual name Marka was, um, it was named collectively with the students, um, the majority uh, proposal. And uh, these are like four pieces that we designed, Ust, Orta, Iskele, Yutong, Particular, based on like um, their location on the side or their materiality, uh, we came up with this. And um, we also got uh, support from Tubitak, from our uh, project management office. Um, Gerfler provided lumber or Yutong pro provided uh, AAC blocks for the workshop. So like this, this is the whole team together. And um, we also wanted to like create a setting for the students in which they were gonna design build, but they were also eventually they were gonna become the users of the project. So we really wanted to put them into like close contact with the idea of inhabiting a project. And um, uh, for both for so logistic reasons and um, for I guess the time was very limited. It was gonna be a six day workshop. We also. Um, picked the site on campus, like right next to our building, which turned out to be a very good decision after all, because um, at the moment, like uh, we use the project, the students use the project, and it's uh, like we have a very strong connection with the project. So, so in a way, it's different from like the community projects that you do. Um, you don't do projects for yourself on campus most of the time, but you go out to do them. In our case, we did the project here. Um, it also became um, we call ours. it reflective service. Reflective <laughs> service. <laughs> and um, here we are on the first day of the workshop. Um, it was it was very interesting uh, because Professor Haley set up a very um, different um, way of thinking about it. Uh, we are thankful for that. So uh, he introduced us to the concept. So. Um, consensus building uh, in which um, in regularly like in studios we always look for original unique ideas like what differentiates from what differentiates an idea from another like how like how much you can get original with it but this was a different process in the sense that um, we had to find like what was common to our ideas not what is like unique or distinct in our ideas so uh, we did a lot of sketches in the beginning, and we got together to discuss like what brings them together, rather than differentiates from them from each other. And um, initially, the sketches were very, were very complex, and um, 
Over time, we started to do the mock-ups, the one-to-one -one, like imitation of the structure, but in this case, uh, it was more like a measure of the topography. You can think of it as like a poetic measure of topography, something that you can relate to. So maybe we can always say like it is like 20% slope, but what does that mean in reality? So we initially set up, um, set up a structure, which became Eventually, it became like one of the final structures, but uh, when we set it up, we also understood the slope in, in an interesting way. Like even the professors, uh, I think they were very surprised with the heights that we found there. Uh, I remember that like for the first time we set up this uh, structure, somebody put the water level on it and we were like fixing it and it, it didn't look flat, right? Like we were all very surprised, like it doesn't look right and it looks like it's about to fly, like how can it, can it look that way? And um, so like we got to encounter the slope, so maybe um, we can say that like we were restoring the um, entities to what they were, like through, by really like seeing them, touching them, really like understanding of our relationship to us in relation to each other. It was shocking to me, coming from Florida, it was, you know, where everything is just super <laughs> flat, and then what was it, 30% slope? Like, it was like, it Something was, like 20, yeah, yeah. 30 bit. I didn't believe it either, I didn't believe it. <laughs> and you're gonna be very surprised, but this is like leveled, uh, what is like on your right? It is leveled, it's, it looks like it's about to like take off from the ground, but it, it is not, it's really leveled, so. That was the um, expanse of this uh, topography we were, we were dealing with. So um, when we started to understood like what like how heavy the material was, uh, how like inclined the topography was, we were starting to understand a lot of things, and we were starting to understand the relations uh, in the context of the site uh, as we were creating this field, and um, it's. <laughs> Then uh, we also noticed that the like sketches, we kept sketching and they started to become like simpler and simpler and simpler. We were also like, we were like cross-checking the scope, uh, the temporal limitations of the work. And um, this is like from the process that um, we had these structures underway. And um, we finished this project in just six days. And uh, here are the students um, working. Can you see yourself here? Maybe not, yeah. And uh, this is the final day. Like, um, so it, it's, it's an interesting uh, event, by the way. Um, they always, like, in, in the literature, you're going to find that there are, like, design build studios, there are design build courses, there are one semester long. Uh, but this was a very short event. It was. Um, it was just six days, and uh, it was a voluntary event, which was very important. People got together. <laughs> people, people got together. Uh, they were like volunteering to do this, so it was. Um, I think it contributed us uh, a lot in terms of like uh, learning to be a team, learning to collaborate, learning to like find common points and um, understand the uh, site. I think this was the nicest weather that we had. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember it rained? Yeah. I think it rained every day. And the mud, you can see the mud, it's dried a little bit, but it was yeah. slope and mud. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, we, were also, we were already not very familiar with the equipmental context of this work. Um, I mean, we are familiar with drafting tools, but what about like construction tools? We weren't familiar with it. Um, and like, we were trying to understand and like, Professor Ailey was trying to transmit this know-how to us through like showing us, training us actually. And then when the context broke down <laughs> because of the rain and because of mud, um, we started to like, we, we learned to get like smarter, smarter with the side as well. And um, I want to show a video. Um, so I also wanted to add, um, so during this process, we started, this was our first uh, ever like design build uh, event that took place in the department and it presents an interesting case uh, because like most of the time design build programs are well established like in the US, like where Professor Ailey comes from. It's so well established like you get into the program and um, people are already familiar with this culture and uh, this was very new to us. So it presented an interesting condition to to record, to document the process, and to also reflect on it. 
uh, which um, lent into like um, into like a research project that I'm gonna show very soon. I want to show this uh, video. So um, because we knew that we were going to like document this process, we also did uh, surveys before and after the workshop to understand the motivations, expectations of the participants and the, uh, the reflections on the outcomes. Uh, in this process, we also um, engaged students to document the workshop. So they created um, three short films from the workshop. I want to show two of them here. This is the first one. The video was prepared by uh, Didanas Gündoğdu, who is a student at our Istanbul at Edis Istanda. Okay, and we have another one from another our student. <laughs> Let's go for it.
So as I said, this was a research. Uh, it was not only a curriculum development project, but we, we also treated it as a research project and um, reflecting back on to what Professor Haley said about like reflecting in action. Um, we also like, um, we treated it as um, like an action and reflection project and um, we, because it was a very large team with a lot of stakeholders, um, Again, like in normal, like regularly in conventional design build studios, you get to have one instructor or maybe two or three at most. Uh, this was a very like collective project with a lot of instructors and um, they all came from different expertise areas. So it was, um, we had a lot of voices uh, in the workshop and um, they were like equally important and equally um, valid, of course. And, so that went into a like, book project, uh, which we are still developing. Um, so we are treating this workshop as, as like a potential for, for also like sharing knowledge on um, the whole process uh, from organization to the outcome. Um, so it is um, showing the workshop, it's taking workshop as the physical context uh, of design build, um, taking us through it and also um, all the instructors or uh, scholars are reflecting on the process um, and we are creating this uh, interwoven um, process of uh, action and reflections in the book, um, which we are still, um, we are developing. Um, I also want to say that um, the, workshop, the workshop space, uh, it also presented an interesting case um, as uh, what I'm go going to call as a chaotic space. Um, more like informal areas of like learning and teaching. So it wasn't happening in the classroom, not in the formal um, curriculum, but it was more, I would say, informal and ad hoc and uh, short lasting ephemeral. Um, and it also shifted the power relations. I think the students were very much empowered and they were really powerful in the process. They were able to uh, lead, after a while, they were able to lead their like, uh, design and building process. Um, so the power relations were altered, which provides the case for chaotic space. Um, and one last thing before I give it to you uh, is that, so um, Berna is going to show us a different case, of course. So in our workshop, we, we were very much um, oriented toward uh, finishing something and um, building it permanently, which is uh, gonna be very different from what we did uh, next time. And I'm gonna give it to you now. Um, everything I'm going to say pretty much is not new in a way, because it's going to be examples to what you have been talking about. Why can't I actually go from this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, thank you. Now, um, so in uh, last year, last summer, I mean the summer before, we had this experience uh, all together. And then uh, as, I mean, all of us know and doesn't, don't, I um, choose not to forget, we had the uh, February earthquakes. Um, during the time, I remember all my colleagues calling each other in panic, trying to come up with projects. Some of them actually did turn out to be um, happening, whereas like many actually died off. But this was somehow like we, we said to ourselves, like, what can we do about it? And uh, looking at the materials or looking at the expertise we had, even though it seemed like a really, really small, really tiny, a positive, ambitious, whatever that is, kind of a task, we thought maybe instead of dealing with post-disaster, we could think of doing something that actually prepares us, makes us ready in the moment of a disaster. Um, it sort of unfolded, um, like with the help of many colleagues, I mean, there's no way anybody can own the idea, I think, among us anymore, which is great, but um, the very beginning of it actually came from this video. Maybe some of you have seen it uh, by Omar Yilmaz and Oğuz Cem Çelik. Uh, in the first week, Omar Yilmaz had gone to the earthquake sites, like all of those cities, and he was reporting from them. Uh, I think he, he saw maybe like six or seven different city centers. And uh, Oğuz Cem Çelik, as many of you already know, uh, he's an expert in um, mainly concrete buildings, I think, as far as I know, but the, he's um, like about their st structural uh, durance, 
how do I say that? I never said that in English, it turns out. Anyway, you, so structure and uh, durability and also assessing the damage in the buildings and trying to understand, um, trying to make a connection between the building stock we have in the entire Turkey and which ones were affected more and why. So it was one of the most important videos, I think, at the time. So it was a very good collaboration. There was all the data in which Amar Yulmaz had surveyed and you know, took pictures, and then there was Ozjem Çelik who was actually looking at them and trying to make sense of what had happened, which was very painful, but uh, on the other hand was very helpful. But within that vi video, which was much more, almost like two hour long, there, this was only, we saw this for two seconds. Uh, it's an image from a park, uh, I think in Kahraman Maraş, I'm not really sure. Uh, and Omar was, was saying, you know, on the other hand, we see people, uh, you know, running onto these parks and then they happen to use existing urban furniture like gazebos or, you know, in Poras they are chardak, you know, these existing things that, and then uh, with their, you know, DIY methods, uh, with whatever they had in their hands, with sheets, blankets, whatever, they actually made their own small super temporary shelters. Uh, so we thought maybe we could, ima if uh, already exist, and maybe come up with some suggestions that could actually be applied on the parks, and then they could become certain urban furniture for, it could be things for children to play during normal times, and then in the crisis time, they would much easier be converted into these super temporary emergency um, shelters. In Turkish, we, what we like to refer to it not as barınak, which is something else, as the, more like dwelling, but shelter as a sığınak, like something that we actually just take a shelter in for a temporary time. Um, so, in the meanwhile, I was already active with uh, Herkes Cimi Marlık, Architecture for All. So we were already in Kahraman Maraş, um, and um, this is a picture from one of the, this is a very famous, I mean, site, because uh, a group of volunteers who had nothing to do with architecture, actually, uh, went to this, um, well, primary school, and then they just claimed the place, and there was nobody to, you know, kick them out. So they just claimed the place, and then they turned two uh, basketball courts into base, let me say, and then the one you see on the left is, was actually covered with this blue material. It held a bakery, a uh, a cafeteria like that fed thousands of people daily. Um, and then they also were kind enough to offer Herkes Cimi Marlik a space to actually keep our tools, you know, because that's the most important thing. It's not safe. Everybody needs everything. So you have to make sure your tools are, you know, locked up somewhere. And uh, so there, this became a waste. Anyway, so I was, this is not our point, but what we actually could really see in the site was that anything that exists can be, be something really important. I mean, who would, who would suggest to you that like just these fences around the typical basketball courtyard saves, saves the day, you know what I mean? It's just like the simplest thing ever, but it meant so much. And so um, moving from there, we, uh, we just came up with this idea, why don't we bring together design, and why don't we use our design build um, opportunity, <laughs> is that okay to say? Both method, but also an opportunity, to come together, to be together, and instead of thinking about what happens after the disaster, maybe try to come up with something not preventive, we can't do that either, but something that can help in this sense. Um, so we had a few online seminars and we basically uh, tried to think about what we can learn from them. These are not that important really, they're just a few notes, but like of what you know, we would basically pretty much probably be working with a local authority like municipalities. So we were in touch with Ataşehir uh, municipality for a short while. It, we didn't really build anything there, but still we had some information from there. And we thought Ataşehir Park could be, you know, parks in Ataşehir actually, in Doğu Ataşehir, it's a series of parks, um, like a meter long uh, walkway uh, around Name mosaic shopping mall, places like that, maybe some of you already know. Um, so we thought of it as a hypothetical context, like, because it's, you know, a typical park in Turkey, or a series of parks in Turkey. Uh, and so we were thinking, like, what we should pay attention to, uh, how would we document the process, all of that, and in the end, we were going to be 
we are going to be, uh, we are, this is still ongoing, as you know, um, thinking of how to form relationships with the existing things that are already there. Like in the case of Marash, it was the fences around the court, around the basketball court. Here it could have been swings, which everybody was obsessed with for some reason. Uh, but also maybe gazebos, also other things. So we basically uh, tried to think of it in that way. So a few images from the online seminar, we had people come over like Urban Coop or Coop. Maybe you already know they do a research on, um, they try to bring together, they, they want to make an open source actually, open database uh, about, uh, well, building I mean, after earthquake or maybe earthquake relief, let's say. And so among the things they had said, maybe you can see on the right hand side, there is a typical flow of things. I know it's a little difficult to read, but usually when we speak of disaster relief, especially in terms of housing, um, you, we've heard of this many times, but just to remember, like the first one would have been, you know, um, before the crisis, which is where we are. The second one would be emergency shelter, which we kind of maybe are thinking about when, with the project we're proposing. But then there is the uh, first, after the first few months, there is the mandatory settlement, um, which is like a through, it's a transitional period really for people to, you know, eventually have an actual shelter on the long run. Uh, we, in Turkey, we have quite a lot of problems with that. We all know this. You can see on the right uh, bottom of, the, of this slide, uh, you know, some of the camps which lack uh, any thinking almost um, because of the urgency, because of the not preparedness, preparedness, well, I don't know that. And, um, <laughs> and somehow, I guess, I mean, probably you would agree that the most difficult thing to design is not the shelters themselves. It's the way they come together, and it's what it's the common uh, common places, I, or public public places that are actually uh, adding on. I also added your image too. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we were also looking at manuals um, and how do we actually propose this project? You know, by through trial series of trials of designing and building and then dismantling building again and documenting them how we could how could we the question was how could we turn that into a manual uh, there has been an ongoing discussion whether we call it a guide or a manual or I don't know any other suggestions um, but yeah so we're trying to come up with this possible way of um, you know it's a suggestion it's the beginning for a series of suggestions probably so um, so let's just briefly go through our hypothetical context. Um, this is, uh, these are the images uh, from you, uh, Haley. Um, so this is pretty much how it looks like, some familiar image for many people who live in Istanbul or in other places in Turkey too. I think generally the languages, the design language in parks is homogeneous, if it's fair to say. Usually they're pretty similar. But this one was really big. It had uh, certain elements like typical, um, you know, the uh, slide, the swing, and, par and benches actually overlooking at them. Here's the swing that everybody was obsessed with because it's the simplest, I guess because it was very simple in form, you know, architecturally we were like all, you know, mesmerized. And then walking in this site, like there also would have been these like super um, unattended I guess, um, parts in the parts around the park as well. So we try to understand. And this would have been uh, one bit where like there was a square with this like really interesting arc-like um, canopies, I guess, that are a bit ambiguous too. But it was, I mean, it was apparent that any structure could actually go uh, with these. We could either, you know, treat them as existing and try to move from them or we could pretty much uh, propose something on the long run that will have similar size, similar functions, similar services. These are really simple things, but they make all the difference. They define spaces and they provide different purposes, usages. So then we came back and um, after this uh, hypothetical context visiting, um, we did the sketching and uh, just walked around all together. Uh, I just you know, crop likes just a few of them. You can see the obsession with the swing on the <laughs> left-hand side. 
And then uh, some of us was, were also interested in how the ground works. So sometimes it would have been the hard ground, sometimes it would have been the soft ground, sometimes it would be leveled with stairs, with other things, and if they actually provided us any opportunity. But then, like, I think um, all of us, like, many of us, or I can say, like, we started thinking about how these items could come together. So all of, like, eventually we start thinking about textiles, because you remember the first example in Marash, like they were using blankets and sheets. So we thought uh, we could actually use some textiles and, you know, not build something that is huge, but instead uh, make these elements be attachable to one another on the moment of a crisis. So all of a sudden it became some not only woodwork really, like building, but also building in such a way that it would allow us to use ropes or strings uh, and like try to think about um, mushamba and textile, oh, yeah. po what? polyethylene, <coughs> you know, uh, all of those. So we, we started thinking about those. And then one um, inspiration was when we were speaking with one another, you know, we usually think about it as like, we have, you know, these um, urban, Furniture or urban, I don't know, maybe urban furniture in general is okay, right? Um, they do, we usually have them to serve their normal purposes like swings, gazebos, you know, these things. But then in the moment of crisis, we always think of it in a linear way, thinking that in the moment of crisis, they can become this and this. But this time, if we were to think of the moment of crisis first, like that's what we're doing in summary, and design according to moment of crisis, then our everyday furniture could also be more varying. Like they would have more variations, more interesting, undefined um, compositions with one another, we thought. I mean, this could also be a moment of where we rethink of what we already have. As a, you know, you know because uh, much of the parks, like I think everybody sort of agrees that we need a variation in our parks, like the design of it, right? I mean, am I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I do, somehow. Um, so, and then we, we thought we could work on it like uh, uh, through a taxonomy, a classification of possible conditions that we could consider. So these conditions are not necessarily like, okay, to the, today the weather is good, today the weather is bad, not like that, not the weather conditions, but more like, what the context offers us, right? Or the rena relationality of things. Thought about existing elements, and then we talked about what the site has to offer. So, you know, elements in urban parks are like, there's a list like that we already talked about, but there was also the site conditions where we could think of it in terms of points, and then levels, then poles maybe, like only the poles like, um, I don't know if that was your word, so I don't want to step out of my line, but like it's a way of defining space, right? Uh, another one. And then there are the edges, there are planes, there are edges, there are also canopies, like all of these uh, could actually present us with different kinds of spaces. Uh, so if we were, we thought like right before we started doing our mock-ups, uh, we thought like maybe we can think of this relationship between normal and crisis, and then we can think of maybe relate them with one element just to start from and then you know play with them to actually uh, collide with one another really like not have a you know a linear relationship but then you know a, the second line could have end up being a roof too like it's just just to begin we had to do this um, purposeful reduction let's say uh, this is my wonderful graph <laughs> techniques <laughs> where i was suffering from anyway uh, but yeah, it's it's trying to do you know what yeah. So we we uh, with all of that we started the making of the thing, things. This was one. Um, this was the biggest in size of what we did as a mock-up. By the way, for people who are not really familiar, uh, I can say that when you see ishkanje, <laughs> no clamps, uh, or what was the other word in Turkish for that? Ishkanje ya da şey. There is another name. Anyway, mengene. That means it's a mock-up. It's like, it's not, I mean, most of the time. That means if we're gonna take it down, it's not staying. So you see the metal things up in the air, th there, there would be those. And then here you see, we are actually right below uh, Arca project where you have seen uh, when Bahar was mentioning. So it's again like similar slope 
going on. So we did like a leveling and then we thought of the swing structure and how it could be combined with, well, before, no, that's later, no combination yet. The, and then we start thinking about a bench, you know, you see the topography here, it's actually, in, you know, uh, rising like towards the backside of the image. Um, and so according to that, we, we're trying to come up with a bench idea. And then these are actually right across. We set them up to be like that, kind of knowingly, kind of not knowingly, I guess. And then here on the back side, you see, um, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have any images of it for now, but uh, you know, a small trial with a, how, I'm sorry, I'll say Bushamba again, polyethylene, and uh, strings, and how they could actually, we tried to leave some, um, I didn't want to know. Some red, like nails or like some things that a string actually can be. Uh, like hooks. Yeah, like hooks, actually. Exactly. We, yeah, yeah, hooks. Uh, for so we, we tried to come up with such details um, through which, like, it was easier to you. I mean, this is too much of a detail, but this was the process. So we try something there. We bring it down. Then there was the pole here. It's not that visible, unfortunately, but I think we will have here in a much better way. Um, this is just a p starting from one pole and then, you know, articulating around that, like what it could have been. And the strings that you see uh, flying up in the air, they would they would actually re uh, represent possible ways of closing or creating closures for the uh, uh, time of a crisis, right? Am I yeah. correct? <laughs> Bahar Oja was more in there, well, so. Uh, in the next slide, it's, it looks like a moment of crisis already, right? <laughs> no, a moment of crisis happening there. Yeah, it's it does look like a moment of crisis, I guess. But we're also happy, so uh, I guess. <laughs> and so this is another uh, view of what we tried to uh, we played around. So another image, so that it makes sense for you. So this bench on the back is actually a more typical bench from one one side, but then on the other, it was it's more like a lounge. I mean, this was just what this topography had to offer, but it could have been many different things we were just trying. Um, and so now that we tried the making, uh, we, we thought like what they could be used like. And then we tried to bring together these, um, you know, mock-ups <laughs> uh, and try to put them in the context of Atasheir, hypothetical context of Atasheir parks. Uh, and this was uh, a collage made by, this one I think by Dennis, as far as I can remember. Uh, also with helps from other people. And you can see, you know, the, because the strings and the ropes actually are connected between the bench and the A, the, the swing-like structure, like we do see, we tried, we tested, tried to test um, possible textile, how it goes with that. Another experiment. So we had to have uh, documenting and redrawing of these things, which we are, I mean, we were still building yesterday, so this is ongoing. I will not be able, we will not be able to present you anything final, but just to uh, give you an idea, um, this is like also done by our, our uh, students who were like really, really did their best. It was incredible. Uh, try to you know, briefly come up with, um, you know, diagrammatic, I guess, uh, drawings of these. Uh, I know these are really small. I didn't have time to delete the black spot. Uh, this is the thing for the bench. And then their relationship, we could actually like try, probably will be you know, diagrammatically talking about different ways of connections between these. So it won't be one ideal textile and rope relationship, but it'll be more like variations of that too. And uh, so from here on, like this is where we are. Uh, we think of, you know, as a, research, like the framework is going to be, as you've seen, we tried out objects and then there will be forces which will actually uh, be about uh, how they combine, they're combined with other material like fabric, like ropes uh, or platforms, like things on the ground as well. And then it's, um, that is forces and then we'll have variations in which like they are combined with one another and then we're going to come up, we're going to try to come up with a system or a site or a field in which like we can articulate them, we can imagine how they would actually operate um, is all I'm going to say. Is, did I miss anything out? Okay. All right. Thank you.